Welcome, this is Information Service Engineering, lecture number 10, Basic Machine Learning. Today, we are going to start this section of machine learning with a brief introduction into the history of artificial intelligence. And you will see that artificial intelligence is more than just plain machine learning. Let me start with a brief example. This is a picture of some human tissue. Now the question is, can you find the cancer? Probably not, since, I mean, of course, we are no doctors. So Google AI detects breast cancer better than humans. And this is already some time ago. So here the system nowadays based on machine learning, deep learning has capabilities that go beyond the capability of humans even. And they are here able, for example, to detect malignous uh, cells, for example, tumor cells. Another example, you might have heard of AlphaGo. This is again from Google, a kind of artificial intelligence, which was able to beat the best Go players of the planet. And even better, this artificial intelligence was not trained by human players. It was trained by playing against itself and thereby it was able in 40 days to gain so much strength to beat the best human player. However, as you say here, the press titled there, Google DeepMind supercomputer learns 3000 years of human knowledge in 40 days, which is of course completely bullshit because human knowledge is more than just playing Go, of course. However, if you're following the press, then you have probably also seen also some time ago that art can be produced by computers, by artificial intelligence. And here, this was the first piece of art that was on an auction at Christie's. And you see here, it was sold for an immense amount of money. Also in science, for example, here in the humanities, in history, um, machine learning is able to help humans. So here, for example, it was able to decipher an old known scripture so uh, and language so uh, completely on its own and this of course is really impressive you have all the links here to um, uh, dig deeper for example into these articles but all of these examples serve one purpose they should give us an impression about the strength and the capabilities of artificial intelligence today now imagine in 1970 already Marvin Minsky one of the let's say pioneers of artificial intelligence said, in from three to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. Hmm, 1970. So this must have been in some alternative version of this world. So it didn't happen. So the question, if we are all doomed, usually, yeah, I guess, we have the tendency to overestimate technology, especially the media. And this is of course one of the problems with artificial intelligence. You always overestimate it and then the drawbacks or let's say the small printed stuff isn't read very well rather often. However, artificial intelligence has made tremendous uh, progress within the last years and we will see where does this come from. Okay, first of all, why do humans or why are humans, let's say, so fascinated by artificial intelligence. Since this is some branch of, let's say, computer science, which is based on um, biological stuff. So it all began with machine learning, or let's say with neural networks and deep learning. It all began when in the 1940s, the mechanisms how biological networks within our brain work was more or less deciphered or explained. So here, for example, Donald Hepp already in the 1914s, he dealt with the principles of learning in biological neural networks. And in 1949, he uh, published um, his book, The Organization of Behavior, a neuropsychological theory, uh, in which he explained how exactly these neurons, these cells in the brain are really working. So you see here, for example, here is a cell connected via an axon to, to another neuron. When an axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B, 
and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both of the cells such that A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. And this often is paraphrased as neurons that fire together, wire together. And this is commonly referred to as Hepp's law. So this is the basic principle of biological neural networks. Also already in the 1940s, these two gentlemen, Donald Hepp and um, Warren Sturgis McCulloch, uh, they both developed a mathematical model to simulate the functioning of biological neurons. You, you see this here. So they really tried to mimic what's going on there in a, a neuron cell within a mathematical model. And you have here exactly also these um, inputs. So where, you know, either uh, some, some stimuli are fired or not, and they are connected with weights, which somehow reflect, you know, how thick is the connection between the cells. And of course, these weights, this is where uh, the part that is learned in the end is in. So these weights have been learned accordingly. They are summed up. And if they are surpassing a specific threshold, then this cell again is firing. So this is the basic model which mimics exactly the behavior of a biological neuron, more or less. Based on that, of course, we can implement the very first neural network learning algorithm. And this was the so-called perceptron algorithm, which was developed by Frank Rosenblatt from Cornell University already in the 1950s. So what he did was simply, he was trying to, you know, put some input weights vector or input vectors with random weights into his perceptron and then was simply weighting all up going through the step or threshold function and see if it fires or not and compares this with an let's say um, expected output and then if the expected output and the produced output didn't match he simply propagated the error back to the weights and adjusted the weights accordingly. That then for the next round, of course, then probably or most likely the computed error is getting smaller, smaller and smaller after each iteration. And thereby the weights are constantly adapted. And this is the kind of learning in a perceptron. So the perceptron is a so-called supervised learning algorithm for a binary classifier. What's a binary classifier? A binary classifier is a function which can decide whether or not an input, you are usually represented as a vector of numbers, belongs to some specific class. And the very first application of such a perceptron was the Mark I perceptron, already here, established in 1957. And this was a huge and incredible machine. So this was purely electromechanical. So it had an array of 400 photocells randomly connected to the neurons the weights were encoded in so-called potentiometers and the weight updates during learning were performed via electric motors and the machine was connected to a camera that used a 20 by 20 cadmium sulfide uh, photocells to produce a 400 pixel image in the end when trained it was able to recognize um, characters and letters of the alphabet and this was used then in the end in let's say some kind of post office to identify addresses so this was the very first interesting application that really worked already by the end of the 1950s and no wonder that you were already able let's say to do image recognition or ocr let's say on a basic ground level there of course you had high expectations for the future let's have a look at the timeline of machine learning. We see here already it started in the 1940s, 1950s. We already have talked about that. And then the heydays, the golden age of uh, machine learning was between the 1960s and 1970s when we have already met that guy Marvin Minsky made also his interesting statement about the capabilities or future capabilities of AI. However, Minsky together with uh, his colleague uh, Peppert they came up with the so-called XOR problem, which in which they proved why these kind of perceptrons were rather limited to a specific, let's say, uh, fraction of functions, which were linear, linearly separable. We will see later on in the lecture what exactly this means, but they were restricted 
they were not able, let's say, to learn all kinds of functions. And this, of course, was kind of a problem. This problem was so hard that something which was called or referred to as the, uh, the AI winter um, took place. And you see here, this uh, lasted longer than, than an entire decade. Yeah, what was the problem? The problem was that, of course, if you want to compute any kind of function based on a neural network, you need more than just, let's say, one layer of neurons. You need multiple layers of neurons interconnected with each other. Although al already here, uh, McCulloch and Pitts have already proved that with a network of neurons, you might be able to compute every kind of function. A network, of course, is something completely different than a single layer. And the perception is only a single layer. You need a full network. And in a full network to, uh, let's say, set back and draw back the error and to recompute and calibrate uh, and readjust uh, the weight will become much more difficult. And it took until 1986, until Rummelhardt and Hinden, Hinden independently uh, formulated the so-called backpropagation learning algorithm, where they simply propagated the error back layer by layer. And um, this worked very well. And then again, new heydays of artificial intelligence and machine learning seemed to come. So in the late 1980s, early 1990s, this was already or also the time when I got in touch for the first time with machine learning. And I also did in my uh, in my diploma thesis, um, I was working on a neural network that uh, should be able to do um, stock market predictions. By the time that didn't work so well, as you see, I'm still here giving lectures about machine learning instead of sitting on my private island. You see, there are, of course, problems. Not every kind of function can be computed. So how did further progress? In the 1990s, there were new kind of, let's say, more robust pr uh, prediction methods uh, coming up, like the so-called support vector machines based on statistical learning frameworks. And then starting in the early 2000s, um, the, the, the mention of deep learning came up, the notion of deep learning. What does that mean? We have here multiple layer networks that in, uh, let's say, on, on highly parallel computing environment can be computed rather efficiently. And already trained parts of the network can be reused and fine grain adapted then for other purposes. And this, of course, um, is, is a, a huge benefit. Not only that, also the possibility to, uh, let's say, to make feature engineering much more easier and more comfortable with so-called convolutional neural networks was, of course, a great benefit and also one of the reasons why deep learning had such a success. So one of the reasons is um, there was uh, or was the availability of really cheap, efficient and highly parallel processing units with these uh, GPUs, these graphical processing units, as you know them from your video game platform, for example. And of course, deep learning training algorithms, they are rather well suited for parallelization. So therefore, on these kind of GPU supercomputers, they could be computed rather, rather and still can be computed rather efficiently. Another thing I already mentioned was this, um, let's say, making feature engineering much more efficient and also automatize feature engineering partly. So these deep convolutional neural networks, they have special kind of layers in which exactly these feature manipulation, feature engineering operations are taking place and can be learned. And they work especially well for, let's say, um, data that is structured like in images. So they were also originally first invented for uh, image analysis tasks. There, you don't have to extract any kind of, let's say, sophisticated feature from the pictures, like, for example, the edges, the direction of the edges, the thickness of the edges or whatever that you find in an image. But that could be created, let's say, or could be learned here 
by so-called convolution operations, this is kind of filter operations and sample operations that take place for specific parts of the images again and again. And they are then learned in the same way, like of course, then the weights for the neurons in the fully connected layer of the neural network are learned. But we will talk about this then in more details later in the lecture. Another thing that was responsible for the success of deep learning is the reusability. So huge networks have been trained, especially here for visual computing, and they of course can be reused. In case they classified, let's say, pictures in specific kind of categories, if you want to, uh, let's say, uh, learn new categories, you only have to do a fine tuning of the very last layers of the network because in the early layers there let's say um, uh, what has been already trained uh, by let's say um, identifying or uh, recognizing specific lines and edges and specific geometric attributes this stays and only then the very last layer putting things together has to be rewired and relearned and this of course made the entire training process much more efficient. And of course, training was also highly improved by the availability of large annotated training data sets that you could find on the web. If you think of image annotation, then of course there were social media platforms where people put their images in and then they gave keywords uh, and they tagged their images. And by that, of course, it was really easy to, to, to get training material for uh, neural networks, which require a lot of training material to really be able to generalize and then to learn and to make correct predictions. Talking about visual analysis, there was a, let's say, interesting or rather famous competition uh, based on a huge data set, which was called ImageNet. And um, by training on this ImageNet, um, you could see here an interesting effect that until 2012, the so-called shallow learning methods uh, usually won this kind of competition or contest. And you see here the error rates on the y-axis and they range between 15 and even 30% in the time before 2012. And then by 2012, when the deep learning models came up, you see that it further declined the error rate and it even surpassed this gray layer, which is the human performance zone. So also humans are not able always to choose the correct category for an image, what is what is to be seen there. But they are even better now. So you see at starting at 2015 already, these kind of networks um, achieve better results than the average human. And to get a slight impression how efficient or how efficiently these these uh, new deep learning networks really work in object detection. I can give you um, a brief example, a real time example where you see a few scenes from a James Bond movie where um, a real time image detection is taking place. And you see this, of course, goes rather fast. OK. So what has deep learning achieved so far? Of course, near human to superhuman level image classification, if you think of the cancer example in the beginning. Also near level speech recognition is able with deep learning, as well as handwriting transcription or machine translation. Also text to speech conversion works rather well. So you see this by the advent of all these digital intelligent assistants that are coming up. And of course, also near human level autonomous driving, whereby people are arguing here whether this is really near human level or far below. And of course, superhuman go playing. So we should not forget about that. However, deep learning and machine learning is only part of artificial intelligence. As you see here, artificial intelligence also contains reasoning, natural language processing, and planning, for example. So we did natural language processing in the first part of the lecture. And we did also, let's say, things connected to reasoning, which is symbolic knowledge representation. That is, of course, what reasoning is based on in the knowledge graph chapter. 
In general, if you want to characterize what is the goal of AI, here John McCarthy, one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence, he even coined the term artificial intelligence in 1955. He said, the goal of AI is to develop machines that behave as though they were intelligent. And this, of course, does not only refer to machine learning, but also to these symbolic knowledge representations and then the programs realized on that that do or perform reasoning or stuff like natural language processing. So let's see how it developed in history, because if we include symbolic knowledge representation, the history of AI dates much farther back than the 1950s. It already started here in antiquity. You know or have heard probably of the philosopher Aristotle. And Aristotle already in the in the fourth century BC. So what he did was he placed every object of human apprehension under one of ten so-called universal categories. So medieval writers um, named them with a Latin term and called them predicamenta. And for these 10 universal categories, he even developed some kind of algorithm when and how to put things of our apprehension in one of these categories. So this was already some kind of a early decision tree algorithm, what he developed. Almost 2000 years later, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, also famous philosopher, famous mathematician, he was going one step further. Besides these categories, he wanted to identify things, facts, relations with characteristic numbers in an unambiguous way. And he wanted to build up some logical calculus based on these numbers. And he called this calculus ratiocinator. So that was his idea. And he wrote in a rather famous letter then, and this was of course his motivation, the only way to rectify our reasoning is to make them as tangible as those of the mathematicians so that we can find our error at a glance. And when there are disputes among persons, we can simply say, let us calculate. Of course, he said it in Latin in the letter calculemus. Without further ado, to see who is right. So he wanted, let's say, somehow to solve any kind of disputes and disagreements by mathematics, by logics. However, he was not able to because what he was missing was the right, let's say, framework to work with it. The first framework, the for first formalization of mathematical logic succeeded here uh, with Gottlob Frege in the late 1800s. So Frege succeeded for the very first time in formalizing classical first order logic. And thus, this first formalization of logic was able, or yeah, was able to to express also a sufficiently large part of mathematics, but also of natural language. So, together with George Boole, you for sure have heard of George Boole and his mathematical analytics of logic, the Begriffsschrift, as he called his kind of calculus, they mark the beginning of modern formal logic. Of course, it was not the same notation that we are using today. So later on, Pierce um, came up with a, let's say, much more elegant solution to note down uh, this kind of first order logic. And we are still using this today. Formal knowledge representation based on symbolic logic then, of course, went on also then here in Cold War in 1950s, 1960s, for example, machine translation was a rather hot topic, especially, you know, translating from Russian to English and back again. This was most times rule based, but yeah, rather difficult with rules, especially if it comes to things like, for example, metaphorical, allegorical expressions and statements. And there is a rather interesting uh, example. Of course, this is kind of linguistic lore. So nobody knows whether this is really true or not, but there is this history where um, they translated uh, the, the English proverb where the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak to Russian and then back to English again with a system. And what they got out in the end was the vodka was good, but the meat was rotten. 
you see the problem there it's again the problem to distinguish between figurative speech and literal meaning which still today is not so easy to solve also interesting symbolic manipulation in the 1960s 1970s there was this kind of block world Schrittlu by by terry vinograd from from mit and there um, the user could carry out a conversation with a computer and it could move objects naming collections querying the state of this simply kite uh, fight block world so it, that was quite nice and you could manipulate all the stuff there already in the late 1960s if we process this further what we are doing today in symbolic logic or knowledge representation we are dealing with the knowledge graphs so we have lots of linked data out there connected to ontologies to symbolic knowledge representations and of course we can use them in kind of expert systems or intelligent systems and intelligent agents and in combination together with machine learning techniques these knowledge representations have really a high potential. And this is the current frontier of, uh, of research. This is also the research that we are doing on the intersection of symbolic representations. So this is knowledge graphs, ontologies, and all the stuff, and sub-symbolic representation, which is, of course, here, machine learning, deep learning. Okay, that was a rather brief history of artificial intelligence and we will continue then in the next section of the lecture with a small introduction into the basics of machine learning.